11, we'll finish out this chapter here tonight, the Hall of Faith, as many have called it, and uh, seeing again after in Hebrews chapter 10, where he concluded that chapter with that truth that the just shall live by faith, now he's giving us examples of individuals who live by faith and all that was accomplished by faith. Uh, As we get to the conclusion of Hebrews 11, we're going to see that rather than emphasizing just an individual, that he begins to just say, you know, essentially, hey, we're running out of time. I, uh, time doesn't permit to go through all the names and all the faith and all the things accomplished by faith of God's people in the past. Now, here's the thing that I want to draw your attention to, and that is that just as these individuals live by faith and accomplished much by faith, so for you and I, we're the ones now who are called to live by faith and to move by faith, and to see God use us likewise in a mighty way. It's we now who follow in the steps of these others who've gone before. In fact, that's how chapter 12 begins, and we'll get there in coming weeks. But tonight in Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 30, and we're going to read down to the end of the chapter. And uh, as we read through this together, why don't you stand with me, and we're going to read corresponding. uh, So I'll read the first verse, you read the second I'll read the third, and so on, all down through the remainder of the chapter. All right, beginning in verse number 30, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Quench the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight thankful for your word. I pray that you would teach us by it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a few things that I'd like to share as we conclude this chapter together tonight. And the first one is, when we look at the faith of our fathers, we see the readiness of faith. The readiness of faith, in particular, verse number 30, as we read through this verse, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Now, we know whose faith, in particular, that's emphasizing. That was the faith of Joshua and also of the people of God uh, who followed Joshua into the conquest of the land of promise. We think back to that occasion. I just want to take your mind there for a moment and the faith that was ready to follow God's plan. Imagine the children of Israel again there in the plains outside of Jericho. Jericho, a mighty walled city. The walls thick, seemingly impregnable. You'll remember when the initial spies went into the land that they said, we can't beat these people. They have walled, defensed cities. We're never going to be able to overcome them. Well, Joshua gathers his men together and, and I can't help but wonder if maybe Joshua and his leaders were having strategic conversations. God has said that we'll fight against Jericho. How are we going to go about doing it? I wonder if the spies brought back their intelligence and combined with other available knowledge, they gave Joshua insights into the military and psychological uh, preparedness of Jericho. Remember, he had two spies go in, right? So he brings back word. I wonder what the word was. (laughs) Was it... You know, we really couldn't find any weaknesses. I don't know what they told him. I wonder if Joshua sat around. Maybe there was one of his, one of the elders of the congregation 
who would have said, well, let's just wait them out, right? A siege will work the best. That's what most would do in those days. Of course, that could take years. Another may have said, I disagree. We just got into the land of promise. This is our first test. I think uh, just a full onslaught is what is needed. And the Lord will help us to get over those walls. Someone else may have suggested tunnels, right? What would have been your strategy? How do you get into this city? How do you overthrow Jericho? Now, we don't know how elaborate their plans were, but we do know their plans were abruptly disrupted when Joshua met the commander of the army of the Lord. You see, God had other plans. The Lord said, and here's what the Lord told him to do. Here's my plan for you. You ready? Walk around the city once, six days in a row. And then on the seventh day, walk around the city seven times, and the walls will fall down. You won't need a siege. You won't need a battering ram. You won't need to dig a tunnel. In fact, you won't even need to sacrifice a single human life. Just follow me, and I'll bring the walls down. We think about the weapons that got offered as just simply the power of God. It says we read elsewhere in Zechariah, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Well, what would you do? The Lord told you to do that. Can you imagine taking that back to your generals? All right, guys, after weighing all the options, the the siege, the tunnels, what we're going to do is just march around the city. We're going to do it once tomorrow, then once the day after that, and then finally on the seventh day, we're going to do it seven times, and the walls are just going to fall down, right? Oh, the initial, the human response to that is, why didn't I think of that? No, I'm kidding. The human response to that is, that's not going to work. Marching around? What's that going to do? But we don't see Joshua hesitate at all. I think that already, of course, he's seen the faithfulness of God. He's seen what faith does, not only when he followed Moses, but already as they've crossed through the Jordan River. He knew God. He knew God's faithfulness. He knew, God, he knew that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. He's the God of the impossible. And because he knew God in his faith, he was just ready to obey. Ready to obey. And that's the readiness of faith. Faith is always ready to obey. Things always, not always, but usually come in pairs in life, don't they? We know what the partner of different matters is. In fact, I can give the word, you can give its partner. Salt and pepper. Hammer and Batman and Romeo and green eggs and... Right, we know those things go together. Well, I want you, biblically, to always associate faith and obedience. Trust and obey. You see, that obedience, those works, always follow when real faith enters. And that's what has been shown over and over again in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not just by faith they sat. They had faith in faith. You'll see in this passage, by faith, again, verse 7, Noah prepared an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed. That's the very word used in verse number 8. Halfway through that, that, that verse, that's the verb. Abraham obeyed. We saw all that Moses did in response and because of his faith in the choices of his life. Well, so it is for Joshua. Because he believed, he obeyed. When you go back in Hebrews, hold your place in Hebrews 11. We can remind ourselves of this truth back in Hebrews chapter 3. He's already talked about this. He's already demonstrated this in this very book. That the, the, way, that you, the way that unbelief manifests itself is not by somebody saying, I don't believe. The way that unbelief manifests itself is by someone not obeying. Back in Hebrews chapter 3, notice. In verse, number, in verse number 17, With whom was he, that's the Lord, grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom he, swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. God told them to go into the land. They didn't obey. And that lack of obedience, he says, was unbelief. 
Disobedience demonstrates unbelief. Obedience is what demonstrates true faith. And again, that's why James says faith without works is dead. We're called to a living faith. For Joshua and the children of Israel in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, when the mind of God was made known, there was nothing more for them to do than just obey. And we come to that point in our life when we've made a, then we've made a spiritual breakthrough. Just to know what God says and then to do it. When God speaks, you move. We saw that this morning with Abraham. God said, listen to Sarah. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Cast out Hagar and Ishmael and cast them out. I'll provide for them. And what does Abraham do? He rose up early in the morning. He knew what God said and he obeyed it. Because of Joshua's faith, he obeyed. And not only that, but because of his faith, Joshua was ready also to endure. Faith not only leads us to obey, but, but faith leads us to enduring obedience. Again, for Joshua, can you imagine that first day walking around, probably full of faith, the second day full of faith? I don't know about you. I wonder if there's anybody, though, in that group who about day four or five, and, and again, that's a long hike. And they're all, you know, equipped for battle. It's not that they're just walking out there, you know, in their, in their shorts and a t-shirt. They're all ready for battle. They're all loaded up. And that's a long hike. And day after day, they're doing this. I wonder how many of the people might have, after a few days, maybe kind of questioned a little bit. Would you start to doubt? Would you ever have second thoughts? Well, maybe I didn't fully understand what God wanted me to do. This really doesn't make sense. I, doubt, I, I don't think Joshua was like that. I think Joshua had full expectation. But there on that seventh day, around once, around twice, around three times, four times, five times, six times around. The Bible doesn't say that anything started to give in the foundation. I don't think that there were cracks going through the wall on after, after turn six. I don't think that there were chunks starting to fall out, you know. I don't think there was any trembling yet. I don't think anything happened until the seventh lap was fully complete and then all at once, Boom! It's down. But I would think that that might test my faith. I don't know about yours. We're almost there and nothing's happening yet, you know? We're almost there. I still don't see anything yet. Is it really going to happen? Is it really going to happen? But you see, Joshua endured. And finally, at the perfect time, when the work was complete, the walls came down. Ready to obey ready to endure. And when faith enters your heart, when true faith is present, when you believe God, guess what? You'll be ready, ready to obey and ready to endure. And that's what we see in Joshua and the children of Israel. There's a second one that we notice in verse number 31 that's spoken of individually again, and that is Rahab. So we see the readiness of faith in Joshua. Rahab illustrates for us the risks that are taken by faith. The risks of faith. The faith, it says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And there's the risk. She received the spies with peace. When faith is in operation, the one in possession of faith, or maybe we could say possessed by faith, will take risks. Though they themselves tell you there is no risk. For their faith is founded on the word of God. It may seem like a risk to the world, but in reality, when it's founded on God's word, the risk is not doing what God said. There's no risk to operate in accordance with God's revealed truth. Rahab, in her life, she had a choice to make. We go back to the story again of Jericho. And that's where she grew up. And that's where she lived. The Bible says she was a harlot. She lived in sin. She served pagan gods. Physically, she belonged to the kingdom of the Canaanites. Spiritually, she belonged to the kingdom of sin and Satan. And up to the point in her life where those spies came in, that's where her allegiance belonged. I'm a member of Jericho. I belong to the Canaanites. I worship these gods. But there presented in those moments was the opportunity to alter her allegiance to renounce her pagan gods, the kingdom of Satan and the Canaanite society to which she belonged and serve instead the
the kingdom of God, to throw her support behind the people of God, not only aligning with them by vote, by, but by yielding her very life for that cause. Again, remember the story? The spies came in. They were found out. They had been discovered. I don't know how. Was it their accents? Was it something they said? But they ran in and she said, come in, I'll hide you here. And she hid them on a roof. And when the soldiers came by, there all of a sudden she's got a choice to make. She's got a choice. Because if she's found out to be hiding them, if she doesn't turn them over, what's going to happen? Potentially. Her life could be taken from her, right? If those soldiers come in and discover those two spies, then she's going to die with the spies. But you know what? She believed God. And by the way, that's, that's almost a reproof in her life. Because you go from the children of Israel who went through the wilderness on their journey to the, to the promised land, having gone through the, the ten plagues in Egypt, having passed through the Red Sea, having been present when God healed the waters and brought water out of the rock, and, and when God fed them with manna. They saw all these mighty acts of God, and yet they get to the promised land, and they don't believe. Rahab, on the other hand, never saw any of that. But she heard. She heard that the God of Israel had allowed them to overcome these other nations. That's, that's what she, she heard and how the, how the Lord brought them out of it. She didn't see it. She just heard it. And yet she believed. Boy, what a reproof to those people of Israel. What a reproof to us. Here's a woman in a pagan society. She's not grown up in church. But when she hears about the, the, the God of the Bible, when she hears about the true God, she believes it, and she believes it to such an extent that she's willing to risk her life on it. That's the risks of faith. She had a choice to make. She had a choice to make. Would she renounce her previous life and allegiances and follow God? You know, she understood. She understood that reality. You, you can't serve false gods and the one true God. You you can't serve the living God and remain enemy to his people and his plan. And it brought her to that place where she had to make a choice. What would she risk losing? What would she risk losing? Would she risk losing, would she risk losing her home in Canaan? Or would she risk missing out on joining with the people of God? That was her choice. That was her choice. I'm so glad to see in her life the choice that she made. You know, we have to ourselves ask, do we have such faith that we're not fearful of losing, of losing things in this life, losing relationships, losing position, losing possessions? Do we have such faith that we're willing to simply follow God? Again, we notice in Rahab's life, that that risk was all led by her faith. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. That decision she made was an outflow of what she believed. Faith always accompanied by works. Maybe you're here today and you aren't saved. You don't know for sure that you've been born again. And maybe that truth and that knowledge that you need salvation... You say, yeah, but, but if I trust Christ and follow Christ, well, then, then I can't do this. Or, or maybe it will, will mean the loss of this relationship or, or this thing that I love. And, and you're, you're caught between two. Which way will I go? What am I willing to give up? You know, faith is the one that makes the right choice. Faith says, I might not be able to see and hold in my hands right now the very promises of God but faith sees those promises and believes those promises and acts on those promises. That the blessings of the Lord is what truly make us rich. And those promises will have an ultimate fulfillment when Jesus Christ returns. Of course, it's not just in salvation, but just in the way we live. Faith is ready to risk the loss in this life to obtain the promise of what is offered in the life to come. We see that with Rahab. We notice also in this passage, not only do we see the readiness of faith and the risks of faith, but also we see the record of faith. 
And again, in verse number 32, we find the author of Hebrews. Again, I believe it's the Apostle Paul. As he's working through so many Old Testament saints and talking of their faith and what they did by faith, he, he, he used an expression like we would. You know, what shall I more say? Time would fail me to continue to talk of the faith of all these people. Just add and multiply record of one after another. So we see in these verses, and we'll just go through them quickly, just reminding ourselves of what was done by faith. Notice in verse 32, he talks of judges and kings and prophets. He speaks there in that passage of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah. And by the way, isn't it, I, I find it a blessing to see some of these guys listed there, that they would be commended for their faith. Because I'll tell you what, when I study the life of Samson, what I see a lot in the life of Samson is missed opportunity as, as unfulfilled potential. But we still find him in the New Testament commended for his faith. That's a blessing to me. You know, the Bible doesn't hide the failings of God's people, but we sometimes fail to see their successes. And you and I, guess what? We don't always walk by faith, do we? And I'm thankful to see that God yet commends Samson and did work through Samson to do mighty deeds. And the Bible says it was by faith. Also Jephthah, Barak, Gideon. And by the way, with Gideon and Barak, each of them, they didn't start out in faith. In fact, both of them started out in fear. Gideon, right? He was the one that was threshing, uh, th I believe, threshing wheat in hiding, hidden. He was afraid of the Midianites, that they would find him. And then when the Lord revealed his plan to him, he's like, well, I just want to make sure that you're going to be with me, right? So what does he do? He lays out the fleece. And after God works it so that the fleece has the dew on it and all the rest of the ground is dry, He's like, you know, I still want one more verification. And so he takes that fleece out again and says, tonight, let the fleece be dry and the rest of the ground wet, right? And the rest of the ground is all soaked. In the morning, the fleece is completely dry. So we see his, at first, his, his, his lack of faith. And yet God still counts him here in Hebrews chapter 11 amongst those that were full of faith. I'm thankful for our God's mercy and grace. I'm thankful for that. We notice their mighty deeds. We see, he says in verse 33, who through faith, through faith, subdued kingdoms. Certainly true of the judges, of David, of Samuel. They wrought or worked righteousness. They obtained promises. David, by his faith and his life of faith, God gave him promises, even in his life, though he didn't receive the ultimate fulfillment of those things, yet God promised him. Promised that through him and through his lineage ultimately would come the Messiah. We find that these men of God by faith stopped the mouths of lions. Now you better know who that's talking about. <laughs> we know that's Daniel, don't we? Why? The Bible says in that story, Daniel believed God. He believed God. By faith, he stopped the mouths of lions. By faith, they quenched the violence of fire. Again, we go to the book of Daniel, and we see those th three Hebrew children, and we hear their faith. Nebuchadnezzar said, what God can deliver you from the fiery furnace? And they said, our God can, if he wants to. They said, I'm not saying that he will, but if he wants to, he can. They were just sure of it. And guess what? He did. They went into the fiery furnace and came out without a hair on their head singed. Why? God blessed their faith. God blessed their faith. It says they escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Again, I looked to Gideon. And there he had 30,000 men to fight in a 100,000 army. And God said, you got too many. You got to get weaker. Right? So he goes from 30,000, I think it was 32,000, down to 10,000. And God said, you know what? You're still too strong. You got to get weaker. What was the number he went to battle with against 100,000 men? 300, that's right. Just 300 men. And yet out of weakness, they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And so it is for us, when we're weak, we're strong. Because when we come to an end of ourselves, we rely on the power of God. 
by faith. By faith. It tells us in verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. We see that in both Elijah and Elisha's life. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. You know, when you read through these verses, I, I just can't help but think, these are, these are our brothers and sisters right here. If this happened to you, but they endured these things. I know in my life I haven't known any that have been so abused for the sake of Christ. Some have been in our church who have because they endured the communists in Russia. And, and uh, right now there are brothers and sisters in Christ, even now because of their faith, enduring those mockings and scourgings, those tortures right now. By faith. And so we look in this passage, isn't it, isn't it interesting? It goes from one extreme to the It talks about all of these triumphs by faith. And now he talks about all of the sufferings by faith. And, and I would say that the, the, the people of God will generally experience both. Well, our suffering may not be at the hands of, of a wicked government. Praise God for that. It could be. It could be. I don't think any of us can take anything for granted or boast ourselves of tomorrow. But you know what? There will be suffering because we've got an adversary and he'll bring persecution to us. It may not always seem in the way that we generally count persecution, but, but if we follow Christ, there's things that we're going to face. There's sacrifices that we'll have to make. We notice in this passage that he begins to talk of some of those who gave their lives for the cause of Christ because of their faith. Verse 37, they were stoned. Record of one in the Old Testament stoned was Zechariah. Zechariah's father was Jehoiada the priest who had brought up Joash. And under Jehoiada and his leadership and his counsel, Israel turned back to God. And Israel, Judah, Judah was flourishing. But then Jehoiada died. Joash forgot the kindness of Jehoiada to him. Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, stood up and he prophesied and preached against Joash and called Joash to repentance. And what did Joash do? He stoned him to death. For what? For operating by faith and speaking the truth, even to the king. It cost him his life. Actually, it didn't, because those who give their lives shall keep it. He went from this life directly to paradise. He didn't lose anything. Rather, his life accomplished its purpose by faith. You go down through the list, it talks about one sown, sawn asunder. We're not positive who that is. Tradition says that was Isaiah. Isaiah served under four kings in Judah. Most notably, he was one of the main counselors of Hezekiah. But also, Isaiah continued into the reign of Manasseh. And they say that Manasseh had him cut in half. But he was willing to go by faith. How far will your faith take you? Will you continue to trust God? Though those around you would not just reject but even harm you for your faith? Again, it's you and I today who are to carry on the torch of faith. I hope that we're ready to stand by faith. I hope that we can continue in this record. I, I love as you read through this in verse number 38, just this little aside, in the midst of all of it, he's pointing out how the world hated these men and women of God. But then he says, Simply, the world wasn't worthy of them. The world wasn't worthy of them. Who's, whose note of affection was that? Who's that speaking? Who would assess these individuals in such a way? It's the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the fact that these men of the world rejected them demonstrated they weren't worthy of them and their faith. So thankful to read these words. 
We go on in verses 39 and 40, and we find the reward of faith. The reward of faith, these all, having obtained, having obtained a good report through faith. That good report is a good testimony. It's a good witness. A good witness. Certainly before God. These ones that are spoken of here in Hebrews chapter 11 are ones that we would say will receive that commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Again, reminding ourselves in Hebrews 11, earlier in the chapter, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But these had faith, and so their lives pleased Him. But that good report was not just before God, but also a good report before men. And that's why we're reading about their lives right now, because their testimony lives on. Their testimony speaks still. Those who live by faith, those whose lives are governed by faith in God, in His Word, His promise, His power, His protection, His provision, those are the ones whose testimony will touch the most lives. And that's what you and I desire. We have to live by faith. We have to live by faith. We see also this reward, though, is not yet fulfilled. Notice what it says. They received, they obtained a good report through faith, but they received not the promise. We could say not yet. It's not yet complete. It's not poured out on them. Why? It tells us, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. There's a promise that God has made to them as well as to us and those who live by faith today, and that's the promise of the future kingdom. Yes, these in this life... Some of them had their lives cut short. Some of them endured those trials and testing times. I look at the prophet Jeremiah. Can you imagine being called to such a ministry as Jeremiah? To preach and preach and preach and declare, Thus saith the Lord, and only be hated and persecuted, thrown into the pit. And then after all of this in Jeremiah's life, he goes and, and watches them continue in their wicked ways. Israel, uh, Judah, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians. The people that are left behind finally tell Jeremiah, we're going to listen to you. Whatever God tells you, we'll do it now. And Jeremiah says, okay, let me hear from God. Hears from God, tells the people. They say, nope, we're not going to do that. After finally they had said they would, they still wouldn't do it. Just going through such persecution, I believe that when it talks about those being slain with the sword, it's most likely speaking of Jeremiah and his ultimate end as well. But when you look at these passages, all of these and what they gave up in this life, it doesn't matter. Because now there's eternity and the eternal kingdom. And that's what matters. They said, I, I can give my life for Christ now. I can give my life for the Lord because this life is going to be gone anyway. And that's the reality. If I save my life, if, if, if I was called to give my life today, if I was called to give my life, if, that was, if the Lord had me before wicked men and they were going to kill me for my testimony in Jesus Christ and I, I denied him to save my life, what have I done? It's pretty tragic, first of all. But what, what about this life? I'm still going to die. I can't escape death. The reality is, for a child of God, one day we're going to leave this life. If God calls us to give it in faith, well, let's give it in faith. And you know what? We have to give it every day. We give it every day. We sacrifice. We're a living sacrifice, and we live by faith. And that's the record. And so right now, what it's showing for us in verse number 40 is that they will not without us be made perfect. In other words, the door is still open for us to join the ranks of those who live by faith we too can obtain a good report. We too can shine as a light to others, but only by faith. The door is open for you and I right now to join these by walking by faith, by, by following God by faith, by serving by faith, so that we also one day will hear from God, well done, good and faithful servant, so that we also one day will have that reward as we stand before him. 
So we look at Hebrews chapter 11, all the record, the faith of the fathers, it comes down to this, to encourage us that we too are to live by faith. Again, this is all in outflow. Look back again, Hebrews chapter 10, in verse number 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith. By faith. And that's what the call is for you and I. That's what chapter 11 is all about. It's going back to that statement. Hey, you're righteous. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. It's by faith that you must live. By faith. Again, remember the book of Hebrews. It's contrasting Jesus Christ with the law. Don't live. We saw it this morning. Don't try to live by law. Live by faith. Live by faith, relationship, fellowship with God, not by law. We look at this passage and that's ultimately what he's describing for us throughout chapter 11, those who live by faith. Tonight, the question for us is simple. How will we live? How will we live? What's our testimony? Not just before men, but before God. Is our life by faith? Are we following by faith? Like Joshua, are we ready to obey because of our faith? Like Rahab, are we ready to risk because of our faith? Like these men, the record of their faith. Will that be our record? Will we also look then at the life of these men and see that reward of faith? And will we enter into that reward one day as well? Oh, may our lives likewise be by faith. Let's pray. Father, I come to you tonight, and I thank you for the privilege of being together. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us. Lord, help us to live by faith. May our lives not be just a, a form. Lord, may our lives not be... Lord, lived apart from you. May we not just live by a checklist, a a do's and don'ts, but Lord, walk with you. May we enter into your promises. May we take you at your word. May we be ready to obey. Lord, help us in these things, we pray. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your power. Thank you that in weakness we can be made strong. Help us, Father, to believe and to trust you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been good to be with you. (laughs) 